four games now of 40 plus points this season. And I was what, like top third of the big 10 top fourth of the big 10 points per game this year. <laughs> Is that right? I think that's the stat. I think Are it's they? something, isn't it something ridiculous like that? I can pull it up here. I got it. Stats right in front of me. Uh, points per game. Yeah. I was number four in the conference. They're tied with Penn state behind Indiana, Ohio state and Oregon for most points scored per game. Think about that. <laughs> I, I mean, it, look, at some point, you got to just look at that and be like, uh, <laughs> so do, do I think that they have a better offense than a few of the teams behind them? No, but is that a substantial statistic that is just jaw dropping and meaningful yes. Yes. after eight, nine games played? Absolutely. It is. Yeah. They're, they're right. As far as points are basically Penn state, Iowa, and USC are all averaging 31 per game. Now, USC's having a rough, rough year, but offensively, we consider them to be a juggernaut, and obviously Penn State is a juggernaut. You brought up that team, Corey. <laughs> I put this stat together myself, so I'm going to pat myself on the back because it just hit me. I don't know why it hit me. These things hit me. I posted this on Twitter. We're going to serve it up here because I found this to be fascinating. So... I am one that, based on having all these channels, took quite the hit on this one because there was a number of times during the offseason, and some of you will understand because we've got a USC show, that I had the audacity at times to, to actually compare Iowa and USC, that Iowa could possibly be better than USC, and that I ranked and rated Iowa to be one rung above USC as a total team. Uh, that that uh, I had all sorts of USC fans that were like, that's ridiculous. And that's, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's outrageous. Well, not only is Iowa a substantially better team this year, they look are. at these offensive numbers. Now, again, is this significant? Substantial? No, it's three games, but it's the same three teams. And these are meaningful games against Big Ten opponents, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Washington. Both these two offenses and total teams played those three opponents, and Iowa scored substantially more points, 113 to 76. Appreciate everyone that enjoyed that post. It got like 530 likes. Uh, so that is meaningful against, again, USC supposed to be all offense and Iowa all defense. Well, the Hawkeyes are complimenting. They are playing truly something that uh, Kirk Ferentz has talked about for years and years and years, complimentary football. Yeah, right now, points per game-wise, they're on par with those teams. Now, if you look at total offense, USC is better. Um, certainly, they have a better pass offense. But I was number one in the conference in rush yards, run yards per game. USC is not even top 10 in that category. So it's a fair debate to have usc fans may not like it but the bottom line is i was a better team and there's not really any question about that they're just a better team so i think that's more of a reflective of the whole and it'll be interesting to see what iowa does against the other los angeles squad this weekend on a short prep week and the two time zone crossover deal that will be fascinating it's a usc excuse me ucla team that's playing better football having crossed over a couple time zones and one a very difficult venue in Lincoln Memorial stadium. So that's intriguing, but I think maybe people just aren't giving Tim Lester quite enough credit. You know, everyone's talking about Brendan Sullivan, what could have been, uh, I get that. That's the title of our show today. What might've been. And I understand that, but at the same time, you look at the numbers and we all, I think basically everybody that is a part of this platform and my platform we all kind of agree collectively that points per game was not fair to anybody as it related to Brian Ference's criteria for remaining in his position last season at 25 points per game and his contract stipulation. And he hit 15 points per game for the season. That wasn't a fair criteria anyways, but it is a part of the equation. So points per game is not the ultimate, but it is part of the equation. And I was not like they're getting a bunch of pick sixes and punt returns for touchdowns, kick returns for touchdowns. But here's what they do. You talk about comp complimentary football. I guess the best way for me to describe it, Mark, and, and stop me if I'm not making sense. 
the best way for me to describe how Iowa is always going to play complimentary football under Kirk in the ideal is you're never going to have a lot of yards. You're never going to have huge passing numbers, but what you are going to have is opportunistic football and red zone efficiency. I mean, look at the red zone numbers from last year to this year. It's just unbelievable. Uh, third down conversion percentage is unbelievably better this season. So when you pair that with great punting, great punt coverage, great punt returning, Iowa has the best return guy, kick return guy in the country as it relates to yardage per game. Those things are very significant. And Iowa is taking advantage of those things, not to mention they have a great field goal kicker in Drew Stevens who hasn't kicked as much because Iowa's <laughs> done a nice job getting to the end zone. I feel bad for Drew. He's had a couple of 55-plus field goals, one doinked off one of the uprights on Saturday that would have made it from like 70 yards. It was just a bomb. But but they have great special teams again, and that's with the departures of Tory Taylor, Cooper DeGene. So that's phenomenal, and I think that's this is the ideal – it's just a darn shame because they blew a game in which they were up 13-0 against Iowa State at home. Should have been up by 17 or 21. The game would have been over at that point. S signed, sealed, and delivered. And then they played in a game against Michigan State where the defense just had its worst performance. One of the worst performances we've seen under a Phil Parker-led defense. And I don't think they'd ever repeat it, but it didn't matter, right? Because you already had the game against Ohio State where you lost. You blew a game against Iowa State. You were, had no margin for error, no room for error at that point. And so that's where we're at. It's unfortunate because I think this team is probably good enough. This team is good enough to potentially compete if they were to make a 12-team playoff. I'm not saying they'd win that first round game, but if they were an at-large team at 10 and 2, based on the other teams in that in their um whatever caliber of, of uh, tiers, I think they could compete, but we, we won't know, unfortunately. Cali football playoff rankings, watch party. Uh, that's a nice little segue right there. We'll get together at 7 p.m. Eastern time and watch the ratings reveal, the rankings reveal with all of you. I want to get back to an earlier point that you made, just to underline something, 15 plus points per game by the total team. Obviously, those that credit's given to the offense, and when people look up points per game, for the offense, about 15.4, I think, was the average last year. Don't recall the year before, roughly 2019 or 20, something yeah, like that. it was going down. <laughs> last year was 15. Yeah, but those teams were supplemented more by defensive scoring, much more than this team is. And even better punting. I mean, like, Tory Taylor is a weapon and yeah. Reese Staken has been really good, but they they've had, they had great field goal kicking during that stretch of time, great punting. And then they had Cooper DeGene, who was just a special teams wizard. So no fair points. And we said that at the time is another reason why points per game was, I think less of a good indicator for Brian um, than maybe in a typical year. Then Corey, the other oddity in this is if you would look at the last four or five years and the record that's been produced with the offense or lack thereof, that if we would have played out this formula without looking at the scores and said, okay, I was still maybe not, you can correct me, please. Maybe a tick off on defense, maybe not quite as good, but still one of the best in the country, top five to 10, the special teams, maybe, you know, and again, you're talking about Tory Taylor, who if we ranked punters, all time in the history of college football, we would have an argument yeah. that he would be, be the greatest there. punter of all time. Yeah, he's right up there. So again, a tick down, but still elite uh, play. And then we checked off that the offense upgrade would be significant, especially running the football, scoring, et cetera, that you would think, okay, well, they've been able to accomplish these, these 10 and two teams, these seven and two teams in the conference. Wow. <laughs> it hasn't translated to the record because, well, number one, they they played an elite team and they normally in the Big Ten Western Division played an elite team, not every season, maybe once every other year, or once every three years, something like that. Number one. Number two, Iowa State's better than they usually are, even though we both agree that Iowa's a better team. And, and should have just, I mean, they dominated the first half. Iowa dominated. Iowa State didn't have a first down until I think late in the second quarter. And Iowa State's better than they typically are. Sure, but they're playing in a conference that's worse than it typically has been. 
Okay. Yep. I'll take that. <laughs> I mean, A&M, uh, excuse me, Texas Tech came up here and won Saturday. And and I thought in that last, I don't know how, if you, did you watch that game? No. So that last drive, I thought Texas Tech did everything in its power to lose. And all Iowa State had to do is keep them out of the end zone. Uh, they had, Texas Tech had two different plays where they had a wide out beat a DB deep. One was overthrown by the Texas Tech quarterback. The other was well, the other one was underthrown. They had at least two penalties in that final drive, one of which came at the one-yard line, first and goal at the one. They take a false start at yeah, the one-yard line. Yeah. yeah, I think they had three false starts on the drive. Three false starts. They just they were asking, please stay undefeated and take this. But what, what's the old phrase? Uh, they managed to what it's it's a they managed to snatch defeat out of the claws of victory. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I, I look, Iowa State is good, and, and I I give them credit, and that's the thing about that game back in September was part of the problem with with how Iowa squandered those red zone opportunities. Iowa State, give me some like teams to Iowa State, teams with like records that are around. Oh, like records, Pitt. Okay, so Pitt. I'm guessing Pitt doesn't have Jalen Knoll and Jaden Higgins on the outside, and Rocco Beck's just adept at being able to put to gr- put together late game drives. And so we all, we knew that even before he did it this year, he did it against central Florida, he did it against Iowa, did it against Texas tech on Saturday, but the defense found a way to lose it at the end. Um, that's why not building that three score lead in that first half was such a problem. And I remember saying it when it happened, like this team is equipped to throw the ball and Iowa's defense. We figured if Iowa was going to be weak anywhere, anywhere it would be, where they lost Cooper to Jean. So I don't know, like you kind of, kind of just worked out the way you didn't, you, you hoped and feared that it, w- that it wouldn't. Uh, and so I don't, I don't know. There's any, there's nobody left on this Iowa schedule. I, like I'll be shocked. And I said this before the Michigan state game <laughs> and I was, I ended up being shocked, but I'll be shocked if they lose to anybody else in the schedule.